Uh, good afternoon to one and all. I wholeheartedly welcome each and every one of you to our webinar, Dominar Pharmacology, Women of Pharmacology, on the occasion of International Women's Day, organized by the Department of Pharmacology, Government Medical College, Kotem. Women's Day is an international day celebrated on 8th March, celebrating the movements of women's rights. Originally, the International Women's Day was celebrated in New York on 20th February, 1909. Later in 1910, the International Women's Conference suggested 8th March as International Women's Day. The theme for this year's International Women's Day is to break the bias. Indeed, no struggle can ever succeed without women participating side by side with men. It is my pleasure to welcome, welcome you all, our esteemed patrons and colleagues for this webinar. Now I would like to invite our HOD, Dr. Sabina K, our pillar of support to deliver the welcome speech. Okay. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon all. On behalf of the Department of Pharmacology, GMC Cotem, I wholeheartedly welcome all the delegates, my teachers, my colleagues, and my friends who have shown interest to attend this webinar, Dominarum Pharmacology, meaning Women of Pharmacology, on the occasion of International Women's Day. A special welcome to Shyam Sir, now, Professor of Pharmacology, GMC Tirundar, and our previous HOD, who has agreed to inaugurate this webinar. Main vision of this initiative is to boost the leadership skills of women, especially women pharmacologists, and to make them evolve in their professional career. Empowering women is essential to the health and social development of families, communities, and countries. When women are living safe, fulfilled, and productive life, they can attain their full potential, contributing their skills to the workforce and simultaneously balancing well with their family life. Empower means to give someone official authority or freedom to do something. Female empowerment represents that awareness both individually and collectively that women have the ability to be owners of their own action, to take action, and ultimately to lead their lives. Empowered women develop their own leadership styles. They know how to communicate. They are influential, and they are committed to innovation. And all the more, they promote female empowerment. Coming scientific sessions will highlight on the contribution of women in the field of pharmacology, role of gender in drug discovery and development, and how much pharmacological response to drug is gender specific. Dr. Harishangar, Dr. Neetu Soman, both assistant professors in our department, and Dr. Abarna, senior resident, will, will enlighten you on the above topics. Once again, I warmly welcome each and every one who are attending this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, it's my great pleasure to invite our dear sir, Dr. Sham is Professor, Government Medical College, Ruandra, to inaugurate this webinar. 
sir you have always been with us le uh, leading us <coughs> leading us your uh, and lending us your wholehearted support to our all endeavors thank you sir please sir okay good afternoon all thank you very much this uh, kotem pharmacology department kotem medical college for inviting me for the you know to inaugurate the this webinar and uh, dr sabina special thanks to you dr denia and our team so dr sabina has already mentioned about the body membrane empowerment and all i have only one word to say to you, all the women in the world that you have the power within you you have to make the mind and thoughts to exploit your power within so that you can make anything possible in the world so in this webinar as sabina has already mentioned everything the contributions of pharmacology and drug discovery the, the role of gender and the pharmacology response of the drugs with a gender specificity or anything talk okay, by the dynamic pharmacologists dr hairi dr neetu and dr abarna of potem medical college <clears throat> whenever you are considering about the women and the medical fraternity i cannot forget forget about the four, four name dr kadambini gangli dr s a padmavadi dr indira hinduja and dr kamini rao so they were the who eminent doctors in the past especially the dr pamini gangli in 1886 she was one of the lady doctor graduated from the calcutta medical college and later her work made the stepping stone for the women aspiring for the career in medical field and when we consider this essay that is shiva shiva ramakrishna ayya this uh, patmavadi she was the first, first lady who has set I mean, set up a cardiology clinic in india and also she was the person who has developed a cardiology department in one of the medical college in india and also dr hindi Indira Hinduja and uh, Dr. Pamini Rao, they were famous and they have attributed their knowledge and power in uh, infertility management. When we consider the pharmacologists in India, I am not uh, familiar with the this uh, older one, but. i start with the uh, dr tangam joseph madam in a uh, kem medical college and she was uh, when I, while i was with a phd student she started this uh, phase one study and fortunately i, I have, have been a part of that this uh, phase one study along with tangam madam also and uh, another person is uh, nilima shri sagar this guy is famous so uh, clinical pharmacologist and uh, manju roy dr manju roy sima patnagar and harsha karwal they are well well known in the development of drug discovery especially in the this uh, cancer chemotherapy and all and when come come to the kerala still i remember my teachers all respect a lot of teachers are there starting with the doctor bhagavathi madam prema madam jilitri sir madam 
then um, <coughs> Rekhnavalli Madam, Vijayaliksha Madam, Prema Madam, Hema Madam, Shamala Madam, Jaraja Madam, and Laila Madam, Dr. Ramani Madam, then Dr. Ajita Madam from uh, Calicut, Kala Madam, the sub principal of uh, Arnagalam Medical College, Kochi Medical College, and Bindu Madam and Asha Madam. So these are the women or lady teachers and I don't want to mention this sir, Pradeep sir, Mohanendra sir, and Nasser sir. They were the, so Nasser sir is still in the department, in Trivandrum, but uh, Mohanendra sir and Pradeep sir retired from the service. They were the male teachers in the department. So you are still saying that empowerment of the women, Pharmacologists, women pharmacologists is, is much, much number, sorry, in, uh, in more number in pharmacology. So once again, uh, we can hope more and more women pharmacologists will uh, come to the department or come to the Indian Pharmacologist Society. And now I come to the, my official duty, officially now announce this webinar officially inaugurated and all the best for the team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I invite Dr. Lanya Ma'am and Dr. Rabina Ma'am to give a token of thanks to our dear Shasta. Good afternoon, all. 
Today, I'm here to present the topic, Contribution of Women in Pharmacology. Many of these women faced enormous obstacles. They were confined to basement laboratories and attic offices. They crawled behind furniture to attend science lectures. They worked in universities for decades without pay, and they had to work as volunteers. And this happened in the US as late as 1950s. So these are the words of Sharon McGreen. She's the author of uh, the Nobel Prize Women in Science. Actually, she used to write about uh, the Nobel Prize winners among women and their contributions. So this was a situation, scenario of women during the late 1950s. And uh, they were not considered as uh, equals to men. So they had to do a lot of compromises. But uh, before that, uh, in my uh, presentation, I would like to highlight the contribution, the invaluable contribution of some of the women scientists uh, in the field of pharmacology. So first one is Marty Louis Walk. So she was, actually she was a, a German chemist and she had to flee to, she was a German, uh, a scientist actually in chemistry who excelled in chemistry and she had to flee to uh, Britain because of the when the Nazis came to power and there she got the opportunity to work with Henry Sir Henry Dale and Wilhelm Felberg there she worked on they both they, these three of them they worked on uh, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine and they uh, studied that the release studied about the release of acetylcholine at the voluntary motor nerve index. And she even co-authored a paper with, Walk, uh, with Henry Dale and Feldberg, due to following which Henry, Sir Henry Dale was awarded Nobel Prize. And in his lecture, he even mentioned the name of Walk. Then she also published papers on acetylcholine synthesis in different regions of the central nervous system. So this paper was the earliest evidence for the role of acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter. And also uh, she uh, helped to uh, understand uh, the regional distribution of the cholinergic systems in the brain. So the, she published this paper along with Feldberg. And yet another paper, actually most of her papers were on the neurotransmitters and their importance and their role on the, and their role especially adrenaline, dopamine, serotonin, and reserpin. And she also published a paper, The Action of Reserpin on the Peripheral Sympathetic System. And her other areas of interest were relation of adrenaline with stress, then about the direct effect of adrenocorticotropic hormone on the adrenal gland. So these were her contribution, major, major contributions. Then we have Edith Baldwin. She was a British scientist Professor of Pharmacology at University of Oxford. And uh, she actually was a mainly a physiologist and her most of her work was on smooth muscle physiology. And she even wrote a book which you can see on this picture, Smooth Muscle, an Assessment of Current Knowledge. So uh, in, uh, and also she also explained how uh, the, uh, the contraction of tinea collae muscles uh, caused depolarization and all. And she also uh, told about the importance, she also uh, understood the role of importance of serotonin in peristalsis in the small intestine. And she published a paper which first showed the synthesis of adrenaline from noradrenaline by an ATP mediated methylation. So these were her contributions. So mainly uh, the smooth muscle physiology, then the role of serotonin in peristalsis and the synthesis of Noradrenaline, adrenaline from noradrenaline by methylation. These were her contributions. And we have Petrude Elion. Actually, she, actually, her name is associated with Hitchings, George Hitchings. She was an American biochemist and a pharmacologist. And uh, as you can see in the uh, next, in the second picture, she is uh, with uh, George Hitchings. And uh, their discovery along with in this and the next slide in this slide you can see sir james black elion and hitching these three of them they were uh, awarded nobel prize for rational drug design actually earlier 
the uh, the technique for a drug discovery was by trial and error method actually that was a very difficult process for this drug discovery because of the discovery of this rational drug design this paved way for the discovery of a large numerous number of drugs according because based on this uh, technique actually this technique this design used certain differences in the biochemistry as well as the metabolism of uh, normal cells and their pathogens and their uh, and how uh, and also how these uh, uh, drug can cause the inhibition or uh, how uh, these drug can kill these uh, pathogens without affecting the human beings so these were their study as uh, in small, uh, in other words they mainly focused on the target of drug action so as i told because of this uh, rational drug design they were able this elion was able to uh, contributed to the discovery of large number of drugs and uh, she actually you, most of her uh, drug, most of her work utilized uh, this uh, um, development uh, of purine derivatives so most of her discovery was mainly on the uh, purine derivatives and some of the drugs she discovered her contributions were pseudoodine which was the uh, one of the first uh, an aids drug which was a, one of the main aids drug then we have mercaptopurin mercaptopurin is it is uh, the first drug which was used in the treatment of leukemia and it was also used as a uh, drug for the management of uh, organ transplant rejection then she discovered uh, azathioprine actually this is a drug uh, which was first uh, which was a immuno which was discovered as an immunosuppressive drug and was used in the management of organ transplant rejection then allopurinol it was used in the management of gout then we have pyrimethamine which is uh, used in the management of malaria then trimethoprim actually it is a drug which is used in the management of uh, sepsis in uh, meningitis and a large number of bacterial infections then we have acyclovir acyclovir which is used in actually she even elucidated the mechanism of action of acyclovir okay uh, so uh, and it is used in the management of herpes infection then nilarabine which is used in the management of cancer so as you as you can see as you can see most of the drugs these are commonly used drugs in the management of leukemia organ transplant rejection gout malaria uh, viral infections bacterial infections etc so she is a one of the main contributor okay then we have the next personality gladys hobby she is a she was an american microbiologist and uh, i actually initially uh, she was the first person uh, initially the penicillin was uh, prepared in uh, uh, laboratory okay so she was the first one who uh, along with her colleagues uh, mayer and dawson they wrote to uh, howard florey and ernst chain and uh, in order to procure a sample of penicillin so using this penicillin sample they tried to create uh this uh, penicillin using fermentation process and they even refined the drug so based uh, uh, after that they even tested penicillin first in human beings and made it possible for this wonder drug uh, to be tested in human beings and it was found to be a success so they first proved that penicillin could be an very effective uh, germicidal uh, drug and it can be even used in the management of bypass uh, okay so she made a very important contribution and this made it possible that because of the discovery it was uh, uh, it made it made it possible that um, there there is a possibility of mass production of penicillin so actually their discovery they earned it earned a lot of media coverage and which allowed for, uh, so much of funding from the american government and uh, following which in the during the world war 2 the, there was mass uh, production of uh this penicillin and it helped in the uh in the cure of so many soldiers so this was this was a contribution gladys hobby along with her colleagues dawson and mayer which has to be mentioned then she also then she joined pfizer where she got the opportunity to work on streptomycin oxy tetracycline etc and which was uh, used in the these drugs were used in the management of tuberculosis and uh, she was also uh, made a uh, like uh, made a uh, leader in this in 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 to uh, 
uh, give a uh, to help in the management of tuberculosis then she was the founding editor of the journal antimicrobials and chemotherapy so this was this was a contribution next we have margaret h rosso she was the first uh, actually she was a, a first member of the uh, engineering association she was an engineer actually and uh, she was she is associated with the mass production even though the idea uh, that the penicillin could be used in humans was given by and tested by uh, gladi hobbes this uh, production mass production was penicillin was uh, just uh, a, uh, ha just happened because of margaret because she designed the first commercial penicillin production plant during world war 2 this is a contribution then we have dorothy mary crowfoot hodgkin actually she advanced this technique of x ray crystallography and help in the help in the determination of the structure of biomolecules and also she confirmed the structure of penicillin then uh, vitamin b12 following which she got nobel prize then she also elucidated the structure of penicillin so these were her contributions then we have rosalyn yellow she was an american physicist and uh, along with uh, solomon burson uh, she uh, won this nobel prize in 1977 for the discovery of radio immuno assay actually radio immuno assay is an in vitro technique it was uh, used to uh, find out quantify uh, the concentration of certain uh, molecules su certain substances by the determination of their concentration of antigen by the use of antibodies so using this technique we were able to find out not not to, earlier uh, the it was used to find out the uh, it was used to detect the levels of insulin in diabetes later on uh, because of this uh, discovery uh, so many the concentration of uh, so many biomolecules uh, etc uh, biomolecules were uh, possible because of the discovery of radio you know i say then we have francis aldam kelsey she was a canadian american pharmacologist and physician actually she was a newer recruiter she was a newer recruit recruiter officer at the us fda and uh, she was uh, actually she worked uh, first at first she worked on the drug quinine and she was able to understand that this quinine had a different effect this drug had a different effect on the uh, baby when compared to the mother so based on that knowledge Uh, she compared uh, the need for uh, certain safety data of the drug thalidomide which was manufactured by the richard merrel company so but there was because since she was a very new recruiter and there was a lot of and also there was a lot of compulsion from this industry to launch the drug because this drug thalidomide it was used as a over the counter drug in uh, all over europe germany uh, europe germany and all and it was used as a motion drug for motion motion sickness by the uh, uh, by and as an anti emetic also by the pregnant woman but since she insisted that she needs no more information regarding this uh, uh, drug thalidomide later on a german pediatrician found that this thalidomide can cause certain birth defects in the uh, babies of mothers who consume this drug thalidomide which is focomelia those those were the birth defects uh, the babies will be having a, a seed like limbs and all as you can see in the picture so this made it a very uh, so she played a very important and uh, important role for the uh, surveillance of drug testing at the fda so the fda made it a strict rule that uh, there is uh, and also made it very clear that this drug testing is very much essential and she also received Uh, this uh, president award for distinguished veterans civilian service by john f kennedy hello another discovery another uh, another discovery is uh, one, one of our next contribution is the drug antibacterial drug sulfanilamide actually it is an anti uh, it was an anti bacterial drug but it, it was unpalatable and it was used in uh, children mainly so to make it more palatable and swallowable an elix, uh, an excipient was used but this excipient caused the death of almost 170 children 
okay later on she contacted kelc helped to conduct animal studies and she was able to isolate the toxic substance which was diethyl glycol so this is one of our other contribution so kelc is known for her contribution in thalidomide and also sulfanilamide then last but not least we have martha wogan she was an american biochemist and uh, she is associated she uh, she told about the importance of g proteins role of g proteins and cyclic nucleotides most of her work work was concentrated among uh, the cell signaling and the metabolism lipid metabolism and all and she is also responsible for the identification of key proteins which was associated with cholera toxin and pertussis toxin then we have jerry cory uh, in this picture you can see carl and jerry cory uh, carl is uh, jerry cory's husband so both of them uh, they worked on uh, the catalytic conversion of glycogen so hence you uh, you might have heard about cory cycle cory cycle so this it is based on their discovery and they were awarded nobel prize actually she was the first woman scientist to receive the nobel prize uh, for uh, in this uh, physiology physiology or medicine and the third woman scientist to win the nobel prize in science then we have yu yu tu she was an actually a chinese uh, a malariologist okay and she and also a pharmacologist she mainly uh, worked on uh, she was the one who discovered about uh, artemisinin and dihydro artemisinin and she received nobel prize in the year 2015 so as a uh, end uh, as a end i would like to conclude my uh, presentation by saying that it is not just these uh, women scientists i may have uh, uh, not uh, mentioned many of the other women scientists but uh, there are many more women actually actually we women actually are the great, uh, are uh, actually the uh, can be called as uh, the avengers you know uh, the superheroes the real superheroes maybe our mothers actually who gave birth to so many scientists and uh, the women is known for their multitasking and because of their family some may uh, have uh, re restricted themselves uh, and have not participated in this con in this competitive field so i would like to i would like to remember them also in my presentation and once again happy women's day and thank you
good afternoon everyone uh, am i audible okay uh, first of all uh, i wish you all a happy women's day and since it is uh, women's day i will steal only a few moments or few minutes of this uh, program so gender uh, discovery and development the role of gender it is a sensitive issue uh, and it's a the sensitive topic also Uh, sorry for the delay uh, there was a technical error so so uh, uh, gender specific medicine uh, it is an area actually not received enough attention but the situation is changing by day by day then uh, is it because of lack of interest or is it because of lack of scientific backup or is it a deliberate so it is actually a combination of all this we can take this as a combination of all this so how this happens so as we know there are disease scenarios where we have uh, differences in the uh, or the uh, the uh, disease manifestations or the disease specificity is different in different genders so there are sex specific diseases like we know the prostate disease prostate vein prostatic hypertrophy or malignancies of the prostate are uh, exclusive in men and the ovarian diseases are exclusively in females so then there are some type of diseases which shows higher incidence in one sex for example autoimmune diseases uh, 70 to 80% of all autoimmune diseases are manifested in females then different manifestations and evolution of diseases so even though the peripheral vascular disease or urinary tract infections the uh, disease can occur in both sexes the evolution and the manifestations may differ in both sexes now what is the reflection in therapeutics so actually what is, what will happen with the gender differences in the therapeutics so first of all we will look into the pharmacokinetic changes in both genders so if you look into the gi tract there is a, in the ph itself in the ph in the stomach itself is different in two genders it is actually told that there is a, a, a there is around 0.8 to 1 uh, ph different in females that is ph is higher in females and when you look into the gastrointestinal transit time it is also long in females so if we take a uh, example of a drug like antidepressants it shows more absorption in females so it may contribute to higher plasma concentration females uh, usually we don't take this into our therapeutic uh, regimes 
when we look into the second part of pharmacokinetics that is the distribution so in the distribution also varies in two sexes because the total body content of men and women differs so the total body content of men is 60% and in females it is 50% only so there are chances of drugs which uh, dissolve or which is distributed in the blood volume blood uh, fluid can differ for example alcohol the plasma concentration of alcohol may be higher in females if we compare the same amount of drug and the uh, body fat total body fat also differs in two sex the total body fat is in females is higher so if we consider a drugs like diazepam which is more fat soluble there are chances of reduced plasma concentration in females when we come into the next topic that is our metabolism there are also metabolic changes in between uh, men and female Me, uh, yes the men and females so for example if we take the cytochrome p450 p450 system c3a4 subtype is more expressed in females we can roughly take it as 30% higher activity in women it is a contributed to the different in, differences in the hormonal milieu so if we have a drug which is uh, metabolized by the c3a4 system so there are chances of reduced plasma concentration in females if we take the doses similar when we come into the last portion of the pharmacokinetics that is excretion or clearance the glomerular filtration and the tubular secretion is low in females so if we take a renal clearance is more in men so if we have an exclusive if we have a drug which is exclusively cleared by the kidneys there are chances of difference in plasma concentration so which can lead to a therapeutic fa failure or higher adverse drug reaction so gender different pkpd so many factors of different pk can lead to difference in drug responses and even to severe adverse events so uh, in these uh, some of the examples we have seen there are chances of difference in plasma concentration which may lead to therapeutic failure then uh, it can lead to a global health care crisis if we are not properly uh, attending into this uh, difference so how we can uh, 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 make it better which we need more innovations innovations and research and development in the gender based drug developments so is it actually uh, a, a possible a, a, an easily possible thing uh, it is actually not because the pharmacol pharmaceutical industry is a business model so it needs it based on a, a profitable a, a 1 trillion dollar profitable business so they don't want to take risks so a new drug development is definitely time consuming as we know at least 10 years for a new drug to come into the market so it is a complex procedure which needs a lot of drug trials then we need uh, to invest a uh, billion dollars into the process then uh, companies must meet the expenditure of new drug or a new molecule research and development its trial in various phases then patents then approval by regulatory agencies and even the failed molecules because we know if we want to make one molecule into the market there will be a 40 to 50 molecules which will be coming together and most of them will fail so the all the expenditure uh, from this new development new drug molecule development should be maintained or should be uh, gained from this uh, time period of before the expiry of this patents that is also a challenging uh, situation in the industry so industry and gender medicine are they aware about this yes the answer is yes and no because why we know uh, tell it as yes because the various regulatory agencies have already shown that or already assured have already uh, came up with different uh, safety issues for example if we consider solpidem fda have told that solpidem dose reduction is needed in women and when we come into the other drugs like terfenadine and cisaprid which are actually have shown more uh, drug related adverse events in females and troglitazone it is another drug which induces more liver damage in females so all these are known to the drug uh, regulatory authorities and to pharmaceutical industries also and why the no component because sexual dimorphism needs more knowledge because the knowledge gap is higher because we don't know the genetic molecular cellular biochemical physiological anatomical and environmental elements in the differences so we have to explore more 
to reduce the knowledge gap in this uh, topic. So developing drugs for a half market, that is another issue, of, uh, another issue faced by the industry because if we develop a new drug and if you market it into the, uh, uh, into the therapeutic use and you tell that it is useful only in one gender, so the uh, total market will be reduced to half. So meeting the expenditure from this half market is another challenging situation. But with the help of various uh, financial help to the industry and from political pressure, the changes are happening in this field because they are trying for uh, optimizing this drug development based on gender. Then obstacles for this gender-specific drug development is another thing is that men and women have same rights, but biologically different. We, even though we know they we have biological differences, but the rights are same. So the pharmacological or the pharmaceutical industry is afraid of using the term gender in it because it will lead to a false accusation of discrimination. So gender discrimination and it will uh, uh, come up with a lot of issues. So further investments in the industry and academics is needed to make the progress. So then only the taboo subject of sex, sex difference in physiology can be addressed. So we need, uh, as we have already told, we have some knowledge gaps which need to be fulfilled. And better understanding in the issue is also needed, better and even optimal outcomes. So if we have uh, uh, properly addressing, if we are properly addressing the issue and we come up with better drug development based on drug, I mean, based on the gender in, uh, gender issues, then we will, we will be having optimal outcomes in therapeutics and we can prevent some amount of unwanted adverse reactions. So that finishes the uh, my topics uh, topic of this uh, presentation. So that is what I have told. I will take only a few moments or few minutes of this show. So this my reference is principles of gender specific medicine tradition, and the uh, 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 the gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. This is the theme for this to, uh, today's uh, uh, it's women's happy uh, women's day. So I wish you all again a happy women's day and thank you. Thank you, Ross. A warm good evening to respected teachers, uh, my dear colleagues and friends. So first of all, I would like to wish you a happy Women's Day. Uh, so on this occasion, I would like to ask you a question. Should men and women be prescribed differently? So there are physiological, social, cultural and behavior differences between males and females. And she must be offered adequate treatment options, diagnostic modalities and preventive care. So we are taught that Medicine is an art of solving our body's mysteries. So we expect medicine as a science to uphold the principles of equality. So we all deserve a fair and ethical treatment regardless of our gender, our race, or the color of our skin. So in this session, I am trying to emphasize the pharmacokinetic and dynamic differences between males and females and how these differences affect their response to drugs. The United Nations uh, theme uh, for International Women's Day 2022 is uh, gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. Uh, so uh, for a sustainable development, we need to stop the discrimination towards females and we should provide equal access to education and uh, employment. But this gender gap exists even today because of some uh, traditional and cultural norms uh, that exist in our society. Medicine is also a man's world. So we are still depending upon the male-oriented therapeutic approaches, which might be bad for health. There is a gap in the knowledge regarding the behavior of drugs in females. 
So gender related pharmacokinetic and dynamic differences must be assessed. Physiologically, males and females are different. So uh, there is a difference in the pharmacokinetic and dynamics of drugs. And there are many other factors that can contribute to this, like the physiological changes that can occur during the different phases of menstrual cycle, pregnancy, lactation, various uh, cultural, social, and behavioral practices can also affect the response of drug. So we can consider them one by one. First, uh, gender can affect the absorption of drug. Uh, uh, male gender, that is males, uh, the gastric acid secretion is higher. That means in females, there is a reduced gastric acidity. So this can reduce the absorption of drug that need an acidic environment for absorption, like uh, ketoconazole. Uh, so they will have a reduced bioavailability and the effectiveness may also be reduced. And unless it is, provide, it is uh, given along with an acidic beverage, uh, the absorption of these uh, drugs will be reduced in females. And uh, estrogen can inhibit the gastric MG. That means the gastrointestinal transit time is prolonged in females. So females uh, have to wait for a longer period of time after food to take those medicines that should be administered on an empty stomach. So like uh, captopril or felodipine. And uh, the first pass metabolism of certain drugs is different in females. Like uh, when you consider alcohol, uh, there is a reduced al activity of uh, intestinal alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme in females. So even after taking the same amount of alcohol, female will have a higher blood alcohol level because of this disparity. And little information is uh, available regarding the effect of gender on roots other than oral. Uh, it is said that uh, the intramuscular injection is the absorption is slower in females. You know that uh, the, there is a difference in the depth of the gluteal uh, fat in males and females, but we are using the same needle size in both. In both. So this can uh, create a difference in the absorption. So the success of intramuscular absorption may be lower in females. And also in case of transdermal absorption, the subcutaneous tissue uh, is higher. The amount of subcutaneous tissue is higher in females. And the skin pores are smaller. So that means there's a chance of reduced absorption through transdermal root in females. So these are a very few examples how gender can affect the absorption of drug. So regarding distribution, gender has an influence in distribution because females generally have a lower average body weight, a higher percentage of body fat, a lower average plasma volume and organ blood flow. So all these factors uh, can affect uh, the drug response in female. So for example, you are told that the females have a higher percentage of body fat. So when you take the example of lipophilic drugs like benzodiazepines or neuromuscular blockers, since females are having a higher percentage of body fat, the volume of distribution of these lipophilic drugs will be higher in females. That means they will have a long T half. So these drugs will have a longer duration of action in females, even if we give the same dose to males and females. So these lipophilic drugs has to be, have to be initiated at a lower dose in females. So on the other hand, take the example of hydrophilic drugs. They have a lower volume of distribution in females. That means their peak plasma concentration or C0, that is initial drug concentration after loading or uh, loading or bolus dose is higher in females. So leading to an enhanced uh, pharmacological effect in females. So these are a few examples how uh, the changes in drug distribution can affect uh, the drug response in females. So all these factors have to, have, have to be considered while prescribing in females. And the uh, female, there are sex uh, dependent differences in drug metabolizing enzymes, especially cytochromes and UGTs. And in females, there is a reduced activity of cytochrome CYP uh, 1A2, 2E1 and UGTs, whereas in higher activity of CYP 3A4, 2A6 and 2B6. Okay, so uh, those drugs that are metabolized uh, by these uh, cytochromes may be affected. The, the, the blood level of those drugs will be affected in females. So for example, erythromycin is cleared faster in females because of uh, the higher activity of uh, CYP3A4 in females. And the flex protein, p glycoprotein, so its activity will be reduced in females, so which can affect the plasma level of drugs uh, that utilizes this particular protein. 
And uh, in addition to these, the effect of oral contraceptives and hormonal replacement therapy can also affect the drug response. So for example, uh, oral contraceptive pills can increase the activity of certain cytochromes like 2A6 and uh, UGTs. So uh, the glomerular filtration rate is 10 percentage lower in females. So this can also affect the drug response in females. And this is important for those drugs which are excreted unchanged through urine. So their excretion will be reduced in females. Uh, so many scientific studies are there regarding the influence of uh, this GFR, this reduced GFR in females. And it has been found out that most of the drugs like digoxin, mancomycin, lecturudine, which are excreted through urine, uh, will be uh, eliminated slowly in females because of this reduced GFR. So the result is that these drugs can produce higher areas in females. Now, there are certain pharmacodynamic differences between males and females, and the most widely studied drugs are the renin angiotensin drugs affecting the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and the beta blockers. So when you consider AC inhibitors and ARBs, they are less effective in females to reduce mortality uh, when given to some symptomatic heart failure. Uh, this is because estrogen can affect the renin angiotensin system. Estrogen can increase angiotensinogen and AT2 receptor enzyme acti receptor activity. They can reduce the renin level, but they can reduce the angiotensin converting enzyme activity. So because of all these uh, factors, these AC inhibitors or ARBs uh, were found to have a reduced response in females. They're less effective uh, than males, uh, less effective in females uh, than males to reduce the mortality. And also the incidence of tough and angioedema is more in females. And this is because of a polymorphism that occurs in a bradycan and B2 receptor, which unfortunately is more commonly seen in females. So most of the females in clinical studies, uh, they, uh, they, they are lost or followed because of this tough and angioedema. Now, um, Regarding the beta blockers, the most widely studied drug was metoprolol, and it was uh, found out that metoprolol and other beta blockers they produce a greater reduction in BP and heart rate in females. It was proposed that this difference occurs because of a difference in the beta receptor sensitivity in females. And also there were other factors were also suggested, like uh, the reduced metabolism of metoprolol in females because of the difference in the drug metabolizing enzymes in females, and also the influence of oral contraceptive pills. It was found out that OCPs increase the activity of metoprolol. So uh, metoprolol and other beta blockers, they produce a greater reduction in BP and heart rate in females. So coming to statins, uh, statins were more beneficial in females uh, to prevent the, the, for the primary prevention of cardiovascular diseases. Uh, because estrogen uh, inhibit the conversion of HMG coenzyme A to myelinate in experimental female models. Now it is, um, it is believed that females generally have a lower pain threshold and less tolerance to painful stimuli. But interestingly, analgesics like opioids, they produce a greater degree of analgesia in females. And this might be because of uh, the difference in the opioid receptor activity in males and females. And certain uh, pharmacokinetic features may also contribute to this. Say, for example, females generally have a lower average body weight. But uh, the dose, we are giving dose in according to the male body weight. So uh, the females will be dosed higher uh, than males. That might be the reason for the higher degree of analgesia in females. And uh, regarding the use of psychiatric drugs, uh, certain uh, drugs like antipsychotic uh, got an enhanced effect in females. And uh, they postulated that this might be because of an increase in the D2 receptor activity binding in uh, females. And also there is an increase in the number of 5-HT1A receptor. So that explains why clozapine produce an enhanced activity in females. <laughs> now, uh, coming to depression, the antidepressant drugs, uh, depression is more common in females, but the effect of SSRI is uh, more in females when compared to that in males. And SSRI is a preferred therapy in females for depression. This is because when you give SSRI, uh, females uh, produce more tryptophan in response to SSRI therapy. So they will have a more serotonin level in response to SSRI therapy when compared to that of males. That is why SSRI is more effective in females when compared to that in males. 
now there are some other certain other factors can also affect the drug response in females uh, like the influence of the different phases of the menstrual cycle pregnancy uh, lactation the post menopausal period the use of hormone replacement therapy now the use of endogenous and exogenous hormones and uh, excipients actually excipients can also um, show gender differences uh, in several studies it was found out that polyethylene glycol is an excipient that was used with ranitidine and this polyethylene glycol they increase it increase the bioavailability of ranitidine in males only but this effect was not seen in female subjects so the excipients uh, activity can also be uh, different in males and females now the influence of gender in pharmacogenetics has just uh, started to be debated in scientific literature and uh, the presence of uh, a particular haplotype of estrogen receptor was found to be responsible for a greater post heterostatin hdl increase in females and certain uh, genes will be expressed in uh, females because of the presence of estrogen and one of the examples uh, is a this one b1 uh, that is ex expressed in higher levels in females that is why there is a higher rate of metabolism of certain drugs in females and there is a gender specific allelic frequencies are also there this particular allele oprm1 uh, opioid receptor mu opioid receptor uh, gene and this naltrexone the drug is uh, more effective in those individuals who have this particular allele and interestingly it was found out that this allele is present in higher frequency in alcohol dependent females so this particular allele is present in higher frequency in females and that is why naltrexone is more effective in alcohol dependent females when compared to that in males so these are a very few examples of how gender can affect uh, the response of the pharmacogenetics and the uh, response of drug so female gender is definitely a risk factor for the development of adia so it was found out that there is a 10 to 15 percentage increase in the development of adia in females because of the various pharmacokinetic dynamic and uh, genetic differences between males and females that we have discussed earlier and the most widely studied adverse drug reactions in this aspect was the uh, the long qt syndrome and the drug induced rashes it was found out that Uh, females uh, physiologically they have a longer QT interval. That is why they are more prone uh, to develop torsa deformes uh, when they are given QT prolonging drugs like Qunidine. And also uh, the incidence of drug induced rash is higher in females. And this might be because of the fact that females uh, generally have a very good immune system and uh, they produce more immunological response. So the production of uh, the immunological mediators will be more in females. That might be the reason uh, for the higher incidence of drug induced. rash in females and uh, there were the several studies were there uh, that uh, confirmed this fact that uh, there in one of the studies it was found out that ibutilide uh, it produced uh, long qt syndrome and this response is was higher in females and uh, under study uh, lamotrigine was found to have a two fold higher risk of rashes in females when compared to that in males so to summarize uh, the differences in pharmacokinetics pharmacodynamics and adverse drug reactions are gender dependent but the effect of gender in drug response has just begun to be evaluated in scientific literature and more and more clinical studies are needed with a gender specific approach and there are more females than males in the population there are more females with chronic diseases than males in the population so a better understanding of gender related differences in drug response is essential to improve the drug efficacy and safety so always mind the gender gap and break the bias thank you it was indeed enlightening now i would like to welcome dr s p danya assistant professor of uh, department of pharmacology kotem medical college now uh, uh, i would like to welcome ma'am for vote of thanks
good afternoon all uh, i have been best of the of uh, a role of uh, giving thanks to each one of you now uh, first of all i wish you all a happy women's day and uh, thank you so much for making this event a big success because this was a very short notice this webinar was possible only because of the whole heart cooperation of each and every one of our department sabina ma'am uh, hod and not to mention all the faculties and sr and jr and the non teaching staff so first uh, it is my uh, privilege uh, to be in this department for having such a supportive uh, team who could make this webinar possible within this short uh, time and uh, i have to specially congratulate all the speakers all the speakers uh, especially dr aparna who was very busy and uh, she took a uh, initiative she volunteered to present uh, within this short span short span means we had this in a very uh, short span five days or something and uh, also dr hari and dr neetu are assistant professors who also uh, showed the metal to do the presentation Uh, in the short time and uh, dr prabida uh, our organizing chairperson uh, we had a bds exams like most of you i know we were busy with our exams we also had exams today and sabina ma'am is also on exam duty and sham sir sham sir our dear sham sir who has left us only recently to join trivandrum medical college he wholeheartedly uh, consented to be a part of this endeavor and a uh, special mention to dr kevin who uh, helped us with all the uh, technical uh, support and uh, uh, with all the uh, jrs and non teaching faculty and uh, now it's time to thank you all all the participants who uh, without a formal invite just with a whatsapp invite uh, uh, joined this webinar so let us all take a pledge uh, to be active and uh, sustain uh, make a sustainable tomorrow thank you thank you ma'am uh, thank you one and all for participating in this webinar so once again happy women's day so let's break the ties thank you Hello everyone I am Dr Ahmed speaking from Government Medical College Kollam thank you everyone it was a great experience to listen all the presentations and especially a novel way to celebrate this uh, women's day thank you everyone thank you Dr Ahmed Ahmed Jeta